This is Duke University. Global trade and environmental Being justice. Human rights issues today. are still. The term Ubuntu. A the Alien and Sedition accident. He's making inferential discoveries. The importance of an archive. The John Hope Franklin Center. I wanted to begin by just talking about the, the ways that trauma has been important both in the humanities and in mental health uh, disciplines such that uh, today we are actually bringing together people from the humanities, from psychology, from psychiatry, and from global health on a shared project. And so the title of, of my talk is Trauma in Theory and Culture. And this is a photo of one of the tent camps in Port-au-Prince that a contact there sent to me. And uh, I, th I think it, it's very expressive of the conditions uh, that people are in, the displacement, uh, the lack of privacy, um, <coughs> the uh, uh, difficulty of reconstituting a new life. And uh, so it's easy for us to understand the trauma that continues to follow the earthquake of January 12th, 2010. So, but what is trauma and why do we talk about it in all these different areas and how can we as a group of scholars work together uh, from such different disciplinary vantage points? Trauma, as Ruth Lays has noted in her formidably expert genealogy, uh, yeah, I think you can see that, uh, is an age-old concept originally derived from surgical wounding. Trauma was imagined in terms of a rupture of the skin or protective envelope of the body, resulting in a catastrophic global reaction in the entire organism. In the nascent neurological and psychoanalytic fields of the late 19th century, trauma morphed into a psychological and psychiatric concept. And yet, as Lays observes, the model of the physical break-in and danger to life has remained indelibly associated with the psychic definitions of trauma and mental health clinical praxis. The field of trauma is thus probably distinct both from physical pain and from affective suffering such as grief that is unrelated to shock, although it has some important points of overlap with both. As Gary Jackson notes, some data suggests uh, that uh, that tests of biological response to specific stimuli can, oops, I'm sorry, skip a slide. Oh, somehow or other the slide fell out. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, the tests of biological response to specific stimuli can accurately differentiate post-traumatic stress disorders from other anxiety syndromes, depression, and pathological grief, which argues for a distinct syndrome these other psychiatric conditions, however, often coexist with post-traumatic stress disorder and may themselves be brought on by life events." End of quote. And it's undoubtedly true that some emotionally shocking events, excuse me, uh, that some emotionally shocking events unaccompanied by threats to life can also lead to post-traumatic stress. The links between vicarious or socially empathic experiences of trauma and biological responses are not fully understood, but the phenomena of secondary traumatic stress or vicarious post-traumatic stress are well documented in domains ranging from healthcare to media exposure. Neurochemical and neuroanatomical changes may therefore be elicited through sympathetic mechanisms as well as by direct organic exposure to life-threatening situations. So for the humanities, this is very important because as in the domain of eroticism, representations of traumatic uh, material uh, can, when there's sufficient subve subjective investment, stimulate biological response and even uh, uh, pathological responses. But direct exposure to disaster has been demonstrated to serve as a trigger for far more significant and long-lasting PTSD than in vicarious or secondary PTSD. And let me just show you some pictures of Psyche. Uh, remember that we're starting here with a motif of the surgical wound. Then uh, we move on to Psyche as the soul in mythology. And here, Psyche is giving uh, 
uh, Eros, Cupid, the shock of his life uh, in this complex game of invisibility and exposure that they were playing. And Psyche then became the unconscious for Freud. And uh, so I, I am just using the couch here um, as, as a metonymy of the Freudian Psyche. Uh, there we go. And uh, here's an image of 9-11 uh, and of breaking news. And it was, it was well studied that people were, in some cases, developing PTSD symptoms from purely uh, media exposure to, to that event. All right. Now, it has been theorized that trauma, unlike depression or grief, is fundamentally a disorder of memory. As Ruth Lays explains, the idea is that owing to emotions of terror and surprise caused by certain events, the mind is split and disassociated. It is unable to register the wound to the psyche because the ordinary mechanisms of awareness and cognition are destroyed." End of quote. So the shocks that create our most searing moments of experience, yet threaten to undo its narration, can be understood as the temporary disabling or splintering of the traumatized subject's cognitive apparatus, in which the formation of memory is temporary for that, temporarily for that block of experience damaged. In post-traumatic stress disorder, the traumatic experience manifests itself not through the hindsight of a coherent recollection, but through dissociated flashbacks, hypervigilance, meaning you're twitchy, you're jumpy, and other symptoms. And people have commented that in post-earthquake, uh, Haiti, twitchy is the new normal. Um, and uh, uh, in the trauma, the otherness of the historical real therefore intrudes without being thoroughly filtered by cognition and subjectivity. So normally, as we are processing life, we have our whole cognitive, linguistic, subjective structure processing that. And many researchers believe that with a truly traumatic experience that there is a suspension of those normal processes, and yet that there is nevertheless a profound registering that is outside of cognitive, linguistic, subjective uh, uh, structures. So the traumatized subject is a sort of broken vessel into which the real spills. The outside has gone inside, as Kathy Carruth asserts, without any mediation. For the humanities, trauma thus poses crucial questions of the relationship of representation to the real of representation to history and lived experience, and of representation and what neuroscientists call mentalizing processes to psychic health. The reestablishment of mentalizing processes of narration, conscious identification and projection, and external self-imagination remain very important to the movement from being subjected to the reimposed traumatic history in the form of nightmares, flashbacks, etc to becoming a speaking subject. Verbal and narrative engagement, are key, which are key elements of the mandate of the literary humanities, are also fundamental to the healing trajectory for t PTSD. What Freud called the talking cure, outside of the specific context of the psychoanalytic couch, lives on in therapeutic prescriptions. That's, of course, just one element and one form of, of PTSD uh, treatment. At the same time, the way we tell stories of trauma varies greatly from culture to culture, which manifest many variations on what Devin Hinton calls idioms of distress, and also on cultural syndromes associated with traumatic symptoms. One cannot blithely engage in what my colleagues Warwick Anderson and Rick Keller and I have called the globalization of the unconscious, when psychoanalysis or psychiatry or any other Western mental health philosophy and methodology represent their own disciplinary translations of the challenges of human experience as universal, because they're not universal. Uh, this is a slide of, of the Champ Mas camp in the center 
of downtown Port-au-Prince. And here you have, uh, you, you can't see, it's public showers, you have the tents. But all of these are built around the pedestal of these historical statues of Haitian revolutionary leaders. This is Jean-Jacques Dessalines. <coughs> and I think it's a good example of, of the cultural contextualization of trauma, uh, that uh, not only are, are people's sort of stances toward uh, rupture and distress different, but they also are placed on longer cultural uh, continuums of, of experience and traumatic experience. Now, in our upcoming uh, PTSD research project in Haiti, uh, we're beginning to identify, with the help of our undergraduate students, the following as areas for further exploration as local idioms of distress. The idea of mauvais sang, or bad blood. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over. Anne Harrington calls this the body that speaks. Okay. Mauvais sang, uh, or bad blood, and also let gâté, or spoiled milk. Uh, which are both fairly long-term Haitian associations with extreme shock as something that has a kind of humoral, uh, circul circulative uh, impact on the body. Mauvais son becomes a sort of mood uh, disorder. Uh, spoiled milk refers to the belief that uh, breastfeeding mothers uh, will lose their milk or that their milk will no longer be good which, as Kathy will be able to explain, was actually quite a crisis in the aftermath of the earthquake. Uh, there's also the feeling of, of being pantin, of, of feeling like a marionette, uh, like you're just being jerked around. Um, you're not really acting uh, as, 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 you, as a person. The problems of sleep, auton sleep paralysis, where a REM, uh, uh, REM sleep experience overlaps with a waking state, and it's often interpreted as a horrific experience um, with supernatural uh, connotations. Uh, ideas like nous fini, which um, one of our students uh, interpreted as we're screwed, you know, we're at the end of the world, nothing will follow this. And constructs of punishment, notably divine punishment. But although these are, are some of the contemporary idioms of distress that we're ex exploring, it's important to remember that Haiti has a, a long traumatic history, sorry, a long traumatic history in terms of the history of slavery and uh, that in colonial Saint-Domingue, which was the name of Haiti before it became the independent Black Republic of Haiti in 1804, slavery itself had brought many observations of idioms of distress. Uh, and uh, the way that I'm going to approach a few glimpses of this earlier history of observations of mental health and dysfunction uh, among the African diaspora uh, in what is now Haiti is through looking at the relationship between trauma and hypnosis. Because when trauma moved from the surgical to the uh, neurological and psychoanalytic fields, hypnotic states uh, and hypnotic treatments were viewed as being absolutely central to what trauma was. And interestingly, in what we could call the creolization of the unconscious in the Caribbean, uh, we see uh, not just the mutative power of hypnosis as trance uh, and as a sort of healing trance, but hypnosis as an epidemiological category. So beginning in the early 18th century, the colonial doctor Poupe Desportes noted the presence of hypnose, hypnosis, or sleeping sickness, which is now called uh, 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 trypanosomiasis among African slaves in Saint-Domingue. Um, and at that time, the dominant meaning of hypnosis uh, was precisely this now unfamiliar lexical area of neuropathically altered somnambulistic states or disturbances of sleeping and waking. So this was long before trypanosome parasites had been identified as the disease agents in sleeping sickness. And Poupe des Portes and others were puzzled by its manifestations in Bosal or newly arrived slaves, as the disease did not spread in the New World arena. Um, 
and uh, many uh, observers of sleeping sickness ascribed it to an array of possible causes, including nostalgia, the slave's languor in the face of the loss of their homeland, stings by electric rays or torpedo fish, uh, or spells by sorcerers <coughs> administering poisons. And this latter idea that, uh, that sort of neurological disturbances of sleep could be uh, ascribed to um, voodoo uh, sorcerers and poison coincides indirectly with the inducement of zombie or zombie-like states in which combinations of herbal ingredients and magic could reduce the individual's affect and autonomy to the state of the living dead. So this category of hypnotic pathology in newly arrived victims of the Middle Passage, with its associations of the depressive languor of nostalgia, electric shock by rays or torpedo fish, which had been used in ancient times to treat headaches and other uh, neurological maladies, or magical and poisoning practices strikingly parallels the mutative power of later psychoanalytic constructs of hypnosis and trauma. The American physician, signer of the Constitution, and innovator in the treatment of mental health, Benjamin Rush, contributed to the consideration of slavery as a pathological state in his 1787 article, An Account of the Diseases Peculiar to the Negroes in the West Indies and which are produced by their slavery. He described the mal d'estomac, or stomach pain, common to slaves in the, in the French West Indies as hypochondriasis. And by hypochondriasis, he meant not that the illness was imagined, because he stated it was often fatal, but rather that it was somatoform, that it, rather than being induced by poisoning as colonists agreed. So he said that it was not poison, and that this disease is, quote, occasioned wholly by grief and therefore stands justly charged upon slavery. Rush also dismissed colonists' insistence that the singing and dancing of slaves was a sign of happiness, arguing instead that it was an effect of mirth, a mirth that he framed as melancholic and traumatic rather than lighthearted. To explain this concept, Rush described the story of a ship's crew trapped on a burning, uh, uh, on a burning ship near helpless observers who for a while filled the air with their cries for help and mercy. But at a certain point there was a cessation of these cries and nothing was heard on board the vessel but a merry tune on a violin to which the crew danced with uncommon spirit until their immo immolation. And for Rush, this macabre anecdote illustrated the likelihood that the music and dances of slaves were physical symptoms of melancholy or madness. And, uh, and he considered this so-called hypochondriac dimension to be a product of slavery. Although Rush did not mention hypnotic states, his emphasis on somatoform and trance-like states framed the enslaved as situationally prone to altered consciousness with physical symptoms. <laughs> the next chain uh, that I would point out is, is that of mesmerism. Uh, at the end of the 18th century, uh, as Chertok and Stengers have noted, what we now call hypnosis was named animal magnetism, a term created by the French physician Franz Anton Mesmer in the late 19th century. And these theories were very important to uh, Charcot and other early neuropsychiatrists neuropsychi as they developed the idea of trauma. And Mesmer, in the late 18th century, had a disciple who imported hypnotic magnetism <coughs> to the colony of Saint-Domingue. That was Antoine Hyacinthe de Puységur. And uh, mesmerism became very popular among slaveholders as well as the enslaved, each having their own baquet or tubs of magnetized water around which they would have uh, healing meetings. And uh, it actually, um, at these meetings, people fainted, people suffocated, uh, they entered into uh, erotic frenzies. Uh, there was a general loosening of normal states of consciousness. And it was uh, ultimately considered a psychic, a psychic epidemic and uh, had to be outlawed among slaves because it was quickly perceived that enslaved men and women were interested in giving uh, voice to an ideology of rebellion and freedom 
through the, mag the magnetist uh, practices. So it was forbidden that jugglers, meaning practitioners of spiritual medicine, Vodou revolutionaries known as Makondal, and, uh, and other uh, slave healers, uh, uh, to, it was forbidden for them to engage in magnetism. Nevertheless, magnetism uh, is believed to have been incorporated into the syncretist and cosmopolitan character of the Vodou religion, uh, uh, perhaps in the form of the trance states associated uh, with being, uh, being ridden by a loa, with having becoming a horse for the loa. And, uh, uh, so hypnosis and mortal nostalgia among newly arrived slaves, turbulent magnetism among slaves in the years leading up to the Haitian Revolution, and a somatoform Afro-diasporic grief generally are not placed on the same speaking body continuum as psychoanalysis or other mental health uh, uh, practices because the familial and inherently bourgeois a uh, psychoanalytic subject is a figure of private Western subjectivity rather than of political collectivities. Uh, however, in 1851, New Orleans physician Samuel Cartwright would reanimate the Greek association of the runaway slave and madness as drapetomania, or the disease causing Negroes to run away, which he said was to be cured either by providing adequate living conditions or by whipping them until they fell into that submissive state. And this diagnosis has since been conceptualized as the disease called freedom. When the Haitian Revolution broke out as a remedy to that disease of the lack of freedom, uh, it was uh, notable how much uh, colonial participants here we go. Oh, that is, here is an image of the torpedo fish, the famous torpedo fish with its, its electric uh, powers. Uh, but it is notable how much people, hmm, what happened to my torpedo fish quote? Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is a long quote from Victor Hugo's novel, Big Jargal from 1826 about the Haitian Revolution. And this is a young colonist who is in the throes of all the upheavals of this complete reversal of, of the positions of masters and slaves. And he comments, unforeseen adversity is like the torpedo fish. It jolts you and then numbs you. The light that flashes before your eyes is nothing like the light of day. People, objects, facts unfurl before you in a fantastic manner, moving as if in a dream. If this violent position of the soul is prolonged, it deranges the mind's equilibrium and becomes madness. Life becomes no more than a vision for the sufferer, a vision which he himself haunts like a ghost. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.